My name is Charlene Vanetta Cromwell. My friends tend to call me Beauty. And um, that's a, a well-loved nickname of mine. Yeah. I actually grew up and I was born here in Baltimore, Maryland. My mom and dad were uh, separated when I was about two years old. So my mom um, whisked us kids off to Connecticut where her father uh, was residing at the time. And uh, I stayed in Connecticut under some very pressing circumstances until I was 11, at which time I uh, ran away from home and went to New York. My childhood was one filled with a great deal of abuse, uh, mental, physical, as well as sexual. Um, I was a child who uh, had to take care of a, a grown man, which was my grandfather, who was uh, a backslidden reverend, uh, an alcoholic who molested me and, uh, you know, told me that I was his wife. So I had to carry on all those duties, you know, cooking, cleaning, taking care of his, uh, his uh, ill-gotten finances, uh, run his bootleg business. So it was kind of rough for me. Uh, I remember being abused by several men that um, came through my household. Um, the number one person being one of my mom's, well, my mom's boyfriend who was very violent towards her and my brothers and who uh, then went on to uh, abuse me until, almost until the, the, the very day that I left. Um, there were also friends of my mom's male friends that um, would molest me if my mom asked. Uh, I remember a particular incident where my mom had to work late and she asked one of her brothers or my uncles to come and meet me at the bus stop. And I remember him taking me behind an abandoned warehouse and having sex with me. So that was just about the story of, uh, of my youth. My first memory I, I had, and it's one of the most vivid memories that, um, that you know, exists in my mind. I remember my mom pulling up onto this parking pad and, um, this man came out, you know, um, he had this color skin I never really saw too much. It was kind of like, he was light skinned but had a really, really red tint. And his hair was silver. He was what you would call handsome. And that was my mom's um, dad. And as soon as we got out of the car, he put his hand out and I immediately grabbed his hand. And I remember being, you know, a toddler. And uh, that's when I thought the world start, you know, first began. The day that I met my granddad. Well, I have so many traumatic uh, memories and I have so many things that I have forgotten but there's one Christmas I would never forget. 
my mom, um, I had to be probably seven or eight. And, you know, when we were growing up, we didn't have a, a, a lot of money, you know, and I suspect that my mom uh, wrote checks and bounced checks in order to, you know, somehow make ends meet. And um, I remember her also being a housekeeper. And this Christmas, everything was so secretive. She reminded us of everything we did wrong throughout the year. And we always knew that when you weren't good for Christmas, you might get like a box, but it would be nothing in it. Or um, there'd be a rock, a rock in it. So I was really scared because I, I was, I don't know, I always tried to be a good girl, but I failed sometimes. So my mom was like really secretive and she said, nobody's getting anything for Christmas and yeah, 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 yeah. And then at like 12 or one o'clock in the morning, you hear all these bags and everything rattling around and stuff like that. And um, she had a couple friends over and I remember the old vents if you turned them, you can look right into the next room. They were like, uh, kind of like a waffle plate. So my brother snuck there and um, he opened up the vent and we looked and it was like Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory. There was so many gifts, so many gifts for all of us, you know. Um, she had bowls and bowls of nuts, as was traditional, you know, with our family. Um, big fruit bowls. It was exciting. We were supposed to be asleep, but um, we weren't. And, of course, my brother Sean, who was always the most curious and the most of a daredevil, when he opened that vent and we seen all those, all those toys and stuff, we were so happy we couldn't go back to sleep. But we had to pretend that we were sleeping. And um, I can remember my mom being really happy that she was able to, excuse me. I remember my mom being really happy because she was able to give us all of those toys and stuff. And um, I do remember the toys, and I got a whole bunch of stuff that I wanted, but mostly I remember my mom being so happy. She was just happy that she could finally give her kids a nice Christmas. So um, that's one of my fondest memories of my childhood. It was the abuse. It was the abuse, it was the physical, sexual, and mental abuse. Um, I mean, I don't know where I would be or who I would be had those things not occurred. You know, um, I saw a lot of my mom being physically abused. And for a child, when you don't understand exactly what's going on, you feel that it's you. You feel that it's you who's caused all of this pain and because you're a bad person or you're not such a good girl that you somehow brought this on, your, uh, on yourself and on your family. I have a memory of uh, being abused uh, that first time. Although I know it was prior to that, I think that the amount of violence and trauma just kind of pushed that as my first memory. I remember um, being in my bed, and my bed was pushed up against a window, 
and I would listen to uh, the radio at nighttime, you know, the love songs and stuff, and I would, you know, daydream and fantasize about the happy ever after stuff. Um, But I knew that soon the monster or my mother's boyfriend would come. I know he would he would be coming soon. And um, that night he came, he had a flashlight on. He had no bottoms on. Um, and uh, he had these magazines with him. And he got in, in bed with me and began to uh, fall under me. And uh, wanted me to have all sex with him. And I said, no, no. I was like, no, I, I'm going to tell my mom. And he held me down and he choked me and he said, who do you think she's going to believe, me or you? And I remember at that time, I thought it was hopeless. I thought that everything was hopeless. I didn't think that my mom would believe me because this guy was so cunning. And even as a child, I knew it, that he was very cunning. And I was also scared that He would beat my mom if I told her, you know, and since I had already saw my mom get beat up by him and by my grandfather, her father, I mean, he hit my mom in the face with an axe handle. And... At that time, I elected I wouldn't tell because I didn't want him to hurt my mom or my brothers anymore. And um, I remember him choking me until I was unconscious. And uh, after I was unconscious, I guess, uh, he did some lewd, very lewd things to me. And... I can remember upon waking up, I was choking off his semen. And he wouldn't let me spit. He just continued to choke me. I have a lot of guilt and shame behind that because I felt like uh, I should have did something, you know. I feel that if I had hurt them, but then I, if I had just done something, I mean something, I think that I would have felt much better about myself and about life, and I think that my mom wouldn't have died at such an early age. So I carry that guilt around, and sometimes, well, it's it's really a hard thing to carry. It's a hard thing to carry. I, I felt that I should have been able to protect my family more. And I didn't. I have a lot of feelings because my grandfather would always, I knew where all his guns were. They were always loaded. And I could have did something to protect myself and my mom and my brothers. But 
But I didn't, and I think a lot of, you know, their lives were also touched in a very, very negative way because of everything that happened, uh, you know, as we were growing up. My mom actually had four children. Uh, I had a sister who would have been older than me, but uh, she was injured very badly in a fire as a toddler and um, had to go through a great deal of uh, surgeries and until she just couldn't take anymore and she passed away. But I have uh, two brothers, and they're both older than me. I was born in 71. My brother next to me was born in 69. And my oldest brother, he was born in 68. So yeah, I've, I'm the baby. Well. Uh, I, well, as I told you, I grew up in an environment. My granddad was uh, a bootlegger. He sold wild Irish rose and, um, you know, wild Irish white. He sold uh, vodka. He also sold marijuana and he sold, uh, needles in which the uh, the addicts could use to shoot to shoot their drugs and most of the time he was drunk you know sleep or if he was up I mean I was his legs I was his arms I did everything so when people knocked on the door I knew if they wanted a bottle of wine, that would be $3. Um, if they wanted a syringe, that would be $2. If they wanted a bag of marijuana, that would be $5. And I was responsible for collecting and, you know, answering the door because he was passed out drunk. Or he just, you know, I, I just, it's something I had to do. Now, my grandfather drank Madruska vodka, and he would always tell me to fix his drink. So it would be orange juice and uh, vodka. And my grandfather would tell me, a good bartender tastes their drink. And I believed them. And so I guess I was about eight or nine when I started tasting his his drinks. And I would all often steal from him in order to give the money to my brothers because he treated my brothers so bad. And I thought it was my fault. It was my way of getting back at him to steal money and give it to my brothers because he never wanted them around. And he always talked about the boys as if they were some, you know, bad thing. So, uh, yeah, I would steal money. He doesn't, he wouldn't know the wiser. I'm the one that collected it all and made it all. And I would give my brothers uh, the little uh, gold envelopes full of marijuana and they would go off with their friends. Now, um, my mom at a time, uh, was attending college. 
She was a pretty pro prolific writer and artist. Um, she even rapped. Her, her rap name was Lady J. And uh, my brother was a rapper too, so they, they, they clicked up and they made a couple tapes together. Mom, I remember her prior to meeting, uh, prior to meeting, I don't know if I wanna say this guy's name, he doesn't deserve his name to be mentioned. Before the devil entered uh, our life, I remember my mom being funny, jumping on us, wrestling us down whenever um, she loved Hulk Hogan. She loved Hulk Hogan. I mean, she loved that guy. And she'd run in there. My brothers would just be watching TV or whatever. And she'd throw them in the okie doke. And I mean, really silly. We would go and play in the rain um, and just run around in the rain. She would play double dutch with us. And, um, but I do remember my mom, you know, when she was having company and studying, she would sometimes close the door and I would smell that musky aroma of um, marijuana. And um, she might drink a beer. And um, that was so common, I didn't look at it as drug, drug use. It was very common, very predominant in the uh, African-American community at that time. What I understood drug use to be was the people that brought those needles and how their skin would be swollen and messed up. So I didn't consider th that drugs and I didn't consider, you know, my mom to be a drug addict and she always still did things. We always had, um, you know, something to eat. Um, so I remember her, it was marijuana and uh, beer. Uh, a little later, once she had become introduced to the devil, you can see the changes in her. She didn't play as often with us. She was drinking more and instead of beer, it was now liquor. Um, I can remember this man being violent, so violent towards my mother. But um, as I said, my, the middle, my middle brother, that's, he's my older brother, but next to me, He's always very curious. So one day, mom, of course, said, you guys go in the bedroom and stay there. I'll be out. And she was in the room with, you know, who I'll call the devil. And my brother, again, opened the vent and looked through. And we, all three of us, got at the vent and looked through. And I remember it being this, um, it was like an older set that maybe a doctor might use of syringes and stuff. And I remember her holding out her arm and saying, is it gonna hurt, is it gonna hurt? And the devil saying, no, it's not gonna hurt. And at that time I witnessed my mom shooting up I don't know if it was heroin or cocaine or both, but that's my first memory of, I guess, actually seeing drugs consumed in that way. And in my child mind, I began to kind of put two and two together in some aspect. So um, if I could e elaborate my first, the first time that I actually consumed a drug, I remember it being uh, 
quite a while after I had run away from home from Connecticut to New York. I was basically living on 42nd Street, riding the subways at nighttime, um, you know, to sleep. Um, I could remember swiping a thing or two from the store because I was really hungry. I even remember eating out of the garbage can, you know, as a, as a, young, as a young girl. So I'd like to go uh, back to the moment that I stepped off the train to, uh, from Connecticut to New York. So I get off the train at Grand Central Station and I remember the smog, the, the, the sound of the underground uh, subway under your feet and the warm air gushing out and the cement sweltering hot where the steam was coming up and people hustling and bustling, going here to and fro. And I remember saying, I, I'm uh, feeling rather, a feeling of being free, a feeling of being uh, a little bit more in control. So, um, quite, a, uh, I'm going to say maybe six months or seven months after I've run away and I've become a little, um, a little bit more smart, street smart. I remember sitting on st some stairs by myself and there was this guy that, um, a neighborhood guy that we called Ghost. Um, I didn't know it at the time though, but I'm sitting on the steps and he goes, hey, you smoke? I said, yeah, I mean, of course, who doesn't? It's pot, everybody smokes. So he said, all right, I'm gonna smoke with you. So he sits down and he brings out this glass contraption with a bowl, uh, a pipe on one end, and I guess something you suck out through the other end. And I remember him, this was uh, probably 81 or 82. I remember him putting some white stuff on the top and he put it to my mouth and lit the, the lighter and I was, I don't know if I was too afraid or ashamed or embarrassed to say, this is not what I meant. You know, like, I smoke, but what the hell, you know, what is this? And it happened to be crack cocaine. So, um, that was my first introduction to real, you know, to hard drugs. Mostly cocaine, I didn't really have too much of an idea about heroin at that time. So um, it was the 80s, it was the crack epidemic, and crack was taking over, you know, uh, New York. And I could remember it being so new that the police would find like bags of crack on someone and they didn't know what it was. And either they would send those people walking or they would take their stuff and throw it into the subway vent, which we had these guys called tunnel rats and they'd go get the drugs after the police dumped them. Uh, from there, I tell you, I don't remember a lot of the 80s. I don't remember. Crack was an epidemic that, huh, it was so far gone. I remember, I could remember getting arrested two times in one day in New York on crack. And that not even making a difference. I went straight back out and smoked. Crack is such a highly addictive drug. 
and you know it touches your uh the stuff that controls pleasure inside your body. And Lord knows I had not had a feeling of happiness or euphoria in all my life. So crack became the answer to all of my questions. Uh, some of the medication that they gave me in order to withdraw from heroin it really, uh, it hurt, hurt me, hurt my dental health a lot because I wasn't told that it would help rot your teeth out. It will keep you off heroin maybe, but you know, you could develop this, that, or the other. I have taken bad drugs. I have taken bad drugs uh, as recent as two months ago. Um, I see that with the fentanyl, as opposed to when they were having at least a little bit of heroin in their mixtures, that you go through a lot of what I call ODing on your feet. Where though you don't fall out, you know, you don't begin to writhe around, you're not having a heart attack, you're actually OD'd on your feet, whereas though you're actually blacking out and maybe not even your best friend will know it. But then you will have a period of eight or 10 hours that you have no memory of. I have been, um, firstly, I have been to uh, the hospital for detox. Uh, whereas though they try to help you deal with the, the pain and the symptoms of uh, withdrawal. So they give you a combination of medicines that m will help you with that, sometimes to include methadone or suboxone. So I've gone to um, I've gone to detox and got what you called a quick detox, which is probably three to five days, just enough to begin the chemicals from starting to get them out of your body, and maybe to put stuff in such as vitamins and. Uh, eating and you know things that will help you medication to help you sleep and um, things of that nature um, in addition I have been to um, outpatient and an outpatient is uh, a place where you have groups on a daily or a weekly basis where addicts come around to talk about the things that they are experiences and we try to give each other experience, strength and hope about what tomorrow might bring. I've also had some bad experiences in treatment here in Baltimore because the underlying more important thing to people is money as opposed to your health or your livelihood or the health and the livelihood of the next couple of generations because you know one person can have that much effect on a generations to come um i've been to uh a treatment program where I was ordered to do it by the courts and um, stay there for six months where I graduated. Um, and I guess that was somewhere back around in 2010. But I can tell you since 2010, it is much harder to detox 
uh, because of the highly used fentanyl as opposed to heroin. Suboxone and methadone wasn't created to help the symptoms of a fentanyl habit. It was for opiates and heroin. And since we have no heroin in the supposed to be dope that there is, and you have a lot of people going through a lot of um, pain trying to withdraw, which generally will lead that addict to say, you know what, I'll detox tomorrow. <laughs> Today, I, I'm going to go get well. I view myself in this society as... a woman who is undermined, a woman who uh, has been miseducated, um, I see myself most days as a survivor, but then you have those days where I mostly feel a victim. And I continue to ask myself, when Granddad said, hey, go get Roscoe, Roscoe was one of his pistols, that I should have shot him right in his head. I think I would have felt much better about my life. The hope, the the hope that I have for my for myself, number one is, right now, I have to survive on a day to day basis. We have the COVID pandemic. There are not a lot of resources that are out here to help someone who perhaps might be um, wanting to detox or might want to have a go to an indoor uh I'm sorry and um uh, an an IOP group and some people that are even they're having more challenges than that so um as I said I found myself not being able to find the resources that I need. And without those resources, there's not a good chance that I will get and stay clean for any significant amount of time. If I was a leader of this, this city and was able to just call shots and have it get done, I would have all of those abandoned houses, I would have them ripped down to the ground and I would have them rebuilt as community houses. Those community houses will help, that would help various people, meaning that not all of them would be uh, places that specialize in drug rehabilitation. There would also uh, be room for uh, survivors of incest and molestation. I would surely uh, build into that uh, life skills, a life skills program and also implement into that a housing thing because a lot of times people don't wanna do drugs, but if you're homeless and you're living on the streets on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, who is the, the likelier one to help you or have a place for you to stay? The neighborhood person that uses drugs. They'll feel, they'll, they'll feel compassion for you before uh, any other citizen would because they, I don't believe they understand what 
exactly drug addiction is. Please like and comment below. If this video has served you in any way, please consider subscribing. Thank you.